Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children 18 plus. You are tuned into the Loan Officer Podcast with me, Dustin Owen, and my special guest who just dropped his book, Unfucking Private Healthcare. He and his wife own a medical practice together, and he also is a business consultant through his company, TriPoint Medical Solutions. He's the one, the only Daniel Tribby. Dan. <laughs> Thank you for being a guest on the Loan Officer Podcast. No, thanks, man. I appreciate you having me here today. So. Um, we have so much to cover, so little time. I, I'm going to have to go straight to the book, though. All right, let's go. Okay. Um, <laughs> if we get a chance, I would like to just dive into what it was like growing up, Daniel Tribby. Okay. But the book, let's start with the title, Unfucking Private Healthcare. Why that title? What's the book about? And more importantly, what was the motivation behind pinning your own book. Like you didn't ghostwrite it. You sat down and you spent years on this, have it published, and now it's a matter of getting the word out and letting people know it's there and they should pick it up. You know, it's funny. Um, you said years. It actually took me three months to write it, believe it or not. Apparently, I had enough to say that I could get down really, really quickly. Uh, uh, <laughs> how many hours a day did you dedicate to writing the book? Uh, anywhere from two to four. Okay. It just depends on I get up at you know, zero dark 30 and do my own reading just for my own you know, mental capacity and, and some coffee to wake my my <laughs> my, my, my uh, sleepy ass up. But then um, I would spend probably anywhere from two, three, four hours on a regular basis and just sit down and, and go to town. Um, but I think that... Uh, um, you know, the basis for the book itself comes from just being in healthcare. You know, I've, I, since 2004, so you're talking about 16 years that I've been in healthcare and anything from being an employee in healthcare to, uh, owning a, a medical sales business to now a consulting business to owning my own practice. I, I've been in and out of it in, in so many different facets and you just notice so many different things that if a regular business like you know, Dustin, you're in, in, in the mortgage business, right? So mm -hmm. if your business ran anything like a healthcare practice, would you have a business? I don't know. <laughs> like, like, like I, I want to dive deep into this because right. I actually, when, when we coach loan officers, mm -hmm. we use some of the um, methodology of going to the doctor to describe how loan officers should run their business. Now, a lot of the times that's because a loan officer tries to be the Jack or Jill of all trades, mm. right? Kind of okay. like the, the, the one armed band leader that's trying to play the drums sure. and, and we'd walk them through, well, what's it like when you go to the dentist office or when you go to the doctor, like, are you the person who actually checks in your, your, your patient or your client? Are you the one who does the blood pressure? Are you the one who weighs them or, or does someone else do that? Because we try to coach loan officers to do doctor work and then to develop teams and utilize those teams to help them process more, in this case, patients or borrowers through their system in a more professional manner. Right. So there, th we actually do use a correlation, but that's more of maybe how to structure their day because I find life insurance salespeople, real estate agents, and loan officers tend to be solopreneurs who can be a, a bit erratic. Mm -hmm. um, so we try to um, uh, narrow their lane and try to keep them focused on on doing what they do well, sure. and then building a team that does that does the other stuff better for them. Got it. So so think about it from a a what's the um, the patient's experience when they go into a doctor's office, right? Because most of your doctor's office, especially the private ones in this day and age, nobody likes to go to a hospital. I know there's this big push to go hospital route, but nobody likes that. Do you want to go to the hospital? If no. You have, if nobody wants to do that. No, shit, that's right? like a last resort. Exactly. So, but these private healthcare systems are essentially, without getting too much into the insurance bandwagon, because I hear that shit all the time, but you, you are such a high quantity. And then when the quantity goes up, the quality goes down. down yes very quickly right so how many people have you ever heard complain well i waited for two hours to get seen for five countless minutes and they handed me a prescription and i walked out and i don't have any answers i don't know what the f like that, that was doctor like spent two minutes with me that was after my eight o'clock appointment they didn't take me until 9 30. exactly yes and the reason a lot of that happens and what you'll hear it blamed on is well the system this and the system that yeah but the system doesn't control how you treat people Right. And the system doesn't control how you maximize income from each person. But you'll you'll hear people continue to hide behind. Well, what does the insurance company pay for? And that to me is a problem because you and I both know that a customer who's already bought from you is a customer who will most likely buy from you again. 
Yes. So why are we flooding our lobbies with an inordinate amount of people to sit and have them wait for two hours to be seen for five minutes and have that complaint when we could be selling to our current patient base, our current client base. Now, is this because too many medical providers rely on um, the insurance companies to market on their behalf and to push patients their way? Or I don't know that there's a marketing push. There. Okay. I don't know any insurance company that markets for anything other than themselves. Okay. <laughs> but well, I guess I'm thinking as a as a person who, you know, I have my PPO that's employer sponsored. And if I'm looking for a certain specialist, I'm going to look, well, which one takes my insurance and which exactly. one's closest to me. Right. And I typically see that list through my insurance provider. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, you're right. They're probably not marketing that, but they are putting together a list service right. uh, versus me going out on Facebook or Instagram or at the next neighborhood block party asking, hey, who do you go to for podiatry? Mm-hmm. But just because you have an insurance contract, does that mean it's the best doctor for you to go oh, to? Oh, hell to the no. Right. Because most people who pay cash for a service get the service that they want Mm -hmm. people who are hunting for which insurance company pays their bill are not going to get the service they desire but then they'll complain about the service that they got but then you say well we're a cash pay practice well why would i do that when i have insurance (laughs) (laughs) what do you want you know which which side of that coin do you want but at the end of the day if you were a private healthcare office, it doesn't matter if you're physical therapy, um, an OBGYN, an orthopedist, it doesn't matter. You have a responsibility to learn how to run a proper business to take care of the people that pay your bills, which are your patients or your clients, however you refer to them. And the problem is, is that a lot of people aren't trained how to run a business. If I hang letters on the door, they will come. That's not <laughs> true. It doesn't work well, like that. It's interesting. You say that about medical professionals, mm-hmm. like some of the smartest of the smart, mm-hmm some of the most driven, the most studious, and who have gone to schooling longer than probably any one of us. Right. Yet, they still don't know how to run a business. And it's interesting because this comes up show after show after show, regardless if we're talking about doctors, or we're talking about financial advisors, or we're talking about the the local person who started their own bar, restaurant, or dry cleaner. Mm -hmm. They're great technicians but they're not necessarily great business operators. That's it. I'm guessing the book teaches how to properly run a business. Your guess is correct. How to create raving fans. Yes. Okay, explain. Yeah, so I think uh, first first of all, you know, you don't have a medical practice without patients, right? So let's let's definitely acknowledge that point. But more patients doesn't always equal more revenue, right? And nor does it equal a better experience. I went from a doctor's office where our doctors saw 60 people a day to now down to 25 a day and we make more money as a whole because we are maximizing what we do for each person. And I said this earlier, once somebody buys from you, they're going to buy from you again. Okay. So I have somebody come in for, and we run a regenerative medicine practice. So a lot of it is stem cell based, which means we don't, there's no insurance that's going to cover this shit anyway. So like my knees are hurting, my hips are getting bad because I'm in my forties and I refuse to quit running half marathons. Right. So let's say you have, uh, let's do a really quick, you have degenerative joint disease, which is something that pops up a lot and it's in in your knee and some doctor is telling you, okay, well, you're going to have to have knee replacement in the next three years. But what I want you to do is try some therapy, have an injection take some meds until the pain gets so bad that now you have to have surgery. That sounds awesome, doesn't it? (laughs) No. There goes your tennis, your golf, anything else that you love to do. Just live with the pain until you can't tolerate it anymore, and then we'll do surgery. Why the hell do we do that? When the body has a unique system of healing itself, right? So we're going to do this, we'll call it a stem cell procedure on somebody's knee to help them improve their quality of life, give them the opportunity to heal naturally, right? And we're going to say this is going to cost you, and this is not the price, but just for easy, where it's going to cost you $5,000 to do this. But you don't have to get be out of work for six to eight weeks with a knee replacement. You can go home the same day. You can resume your normal daily activities. And over the course of the next three to six months, you should see gradual change. And, and your stomach, your liver, and your kidneys will love the fact that you're not eating a bottle of Advil a month Perfect. or a week. Right. And you don't yeah. have to go under anesthesia. You don't have to be knocked out. You don't have any of that. Right. So if we're going to provide that type of treatment for somebody, we, and we're going to charge them 5,000, we've got to provide a level of service for yes. them, right? They can't just walk in the door and be greeted by the one finger up. Please have a seat. I'll get with you when I have a f-ing moment, right? <laughs> it's got to be a, Hey, how are you? Nice to see you today. Can I get you a bottle of water? You know, tell me what's the most important thing for you as far as this visit goes today. 
It's all about the patient experience. Exactly. So, and a lot of doctor's offices don't do that. The, when was the last time you went to a doctor's office and the lady behind the desk said, hey, how are you, Mr. Owen? My name is Sarah. Um, so this doesn't happen <laughs> at my doctor's office. Right. It does happen at my dentist office. Beautiful. But that being said, my dentist is a good buddy of mine. Mm-hmm. And I know how much money and time he and his partners invest mm-hmm. in consulting services like yours, right. where they learn this. And right. then they try to take what they learn and put it into practice. Mm-hmm. Um, so th- I know he has that going for him. And probably because it is me and they know that I'm friends with Dr. Curley, mm-hmm. that like, oh, here comes one of Dr. Curley's friends. We need to make sure we're really nice to him. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, but yeah, but no, very rarely at a doctor's office do I get that. Right. Um, but uh, I do at my dentist's office. Right. So, and, th- and that's a great thing. And I feel like because that is a, that's an anomaly. Why is that the case? Yeah. Why is that? Why are we not doing more for the people that come in to seek out our services, right? So I take 5,000, I make somebody's knee feel better, and we treat them like an individual. We root them on during their process. They actually get better. They leave us a review. And you know what else we say? We say, hey, who else do you know that we can help? Yes. And then we say, you know, oh, by the way, we offer some other services within our practice that may help you with ABC. Would you like to take part in those? Yes, absolutely. So you're marketing to them continuously. It's not just a, I came in, I had my visit today, I paid my my copay, I'm out, I'll see you guys the next time I need you. No, it's a nurturing relationship, right? So you move from not just creating a raving fan, but creating a raving fan that sends people to you and that will continue to purchase from you. This is marketing and sales all day long. Customer service is sales, sales is customer service. I don't care what anybody else says, okay? It's not the cheesy car salesman type of thing, which is what I hear all the time. I don't wanna come across as too salesy. I had a doctor two weeks ago, I don't wanna come across as too salesy. If you don't sell to them, somebody else will. Why the f- is that so hard for people to understand? <laughs> and as you market to these people, and doctors are terrible to markers because all they want to do is talk about how great they are. Mm-hmm. Oh, I graduated top of my class at Harvard Medical School, and I'm the number one cardiologist. Nobody gives a shit. What they care about is the life that you're going to give back to them. You will be able to pick up your kids without back pain. You'll be able to get on the floor as a grandparent and play the board game with your brand new grandson, You know, whatever it is that limits their life. Give that to them. Stop talking about how great you are and talk about what you're going to do to make their life great. Yeah, spot on. I mean, that is the book I'm reading right now. Um, the, the the author of the book is talking about straight line selling. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's it's it sales 101 that you and I were taught, but probably doctors and so many other technicians uh, weren't taught, which is A, find the pain point. But more importantly, show them how you're going to make their life better. Mm-hmm. Like why by using your service or buying your product is my life going to be better? Right. Once you can do that, then you have a client for life. Mm-hmm. I heard Dean Graziosi say this the other day, and it really stuck with me. He's like, nobody cares about understanding you. They want to know that they're understood. And I was like, wow, that's so true, because people don't, you don't care how much I know. You only care how much I understand about you and how I can help you get to where you want to go. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Do I hear you? Am I listening to you? Right. And I think a lot of people just are thumbing their way through their day. Here's a list of patients, and oh, I gotta check that one off. Let's check that one off. Check that one off the list. And nobody's really paying attention to what somebody is saying, nor how are they making them feel, and then capitalizing on the positivity that somebody tells you, the way you made them feel. Hey, this was this was really great. I, this experience was awesome. Thank you so much. Would you do me a favor and leave us a review? Or better yet, could I send? Could I give you a card that you could pass on to somebody else that may? be looking for a similar service. We don't do that. Why, why don't healthcare professionals do that? Every other business on the sun does. Healthcare does not. Why? Yeah, no, it, to me, it's baffling. And I'm as you're sitting here talking, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, how does this correlate to so many other businesses? So you run a business mm-hmm. where you're, you're, it's a healthcare providing business, right? It's a medical center. Right. 80% of your patients pay cash. Yeah. That means you're only accepting insurance on 20%. Yep which is probably the exact opposite for what the industry average is, if I were to guess. I would Absolutely. guess 80% of, of doctors are attached to the hip to, to uh, those that come in mm-hmm. with insurance, and 20% are paying cash. Mm-hmm. But you have found that by flipping the script, you're able to spend more time with patients, see less patients, but make more money. Yeah. Yeah. Why wouldn't everyone want to do that? And that's that's all all industries. Like when I look at um, the financial sales industry, 
It's why do you want to go spend all this money on leads? Right. Where if you if you run your business differently, you don't need to. Right. Right. If if you focus more on doing the right job up front, treating your clients like they're individuals and not like their numbers, mm -hmm. giving them a service that is far and above anywhere else, then you're going to create a client for life and then more importantly, a raving fan. And yep. what do raving fans do? They talk about you openly and honestly with their circle of influence, at which point there's your, your next wave of clients right. um, coming your way. And I, I think a lot of people don't make that cash move because it requires a certain level of marketing and sales that nobody knows in this field, in, yep. in healthcare. Um, if you're, if you're not educated on how to sell your services or how to market yourself, then it doesn't matter how many leads you have. You know, I'm inundated every day. Wouldn't it be great to have 40 more leads in your practice? Yes, of course it would. But if I can't sell them, what does it matter? Right? Yeah. If you're not going to teach these, these offices how to accept that load and sell these patients on what they really need and want, what the f is 40 more leads a month going to do for anybody? It's not going to do anything. You know, so to answer your question from a cash pay standpoint, a lot of people can't do it because they don't know how. And a lot of society isn't uh, really educated on why they should go for a cash pay doctor when they pay money for insurance. But I guarantee them to you, if your dog got hit by a car and it cost you $5,000 to get the dog fixed, <laughs> you'd pay it, right? Yes. But if I told you, well, I can fix your elbow without surgery and it's gonna cost you $5,000, people be like, well, does my insurance cover that? Why do we yeah. do that? Why is my health care something to be negotiated, but my dog's health care is not? My car, if you had a problem with your car getting from A to B to go to work, you'd spend the money it took to get the car right. But if my body doesn't get me from A to B, oh, my insurance doesn't cover it. I can't do it. Why do people do that? So that it's is a fascinating. It's a mindset change that, that needs to happen. No, does that happen though with the medical provider? Like, is it like like in, in my world, in the loan officer world, it is on me and or my staff, other loan officers, to properly educate. <clears throat> the American populace, that there's no such thing as a one size fits all mortgage. You don't just call up and say, hey, what's your 30 year fixed? Right. Like you just, right, you don't. There's a diagnosis that goes into it. And um, you know, we, we have a business saying that actually we steal from the medical profession, which is, um, oh, mine just went blank. It's like diagnosis without, um, no, not diagnosis, um, what's it? Damn it. <laughs> look at that, look at that, 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 that mind blank, but it's, it's basically, it's malpractice. It's, it's when you diagnose something without actually researching the symptoms, right? That, right. The, that is malpractice. Mm -hmm. That happens time and time again in, in our industry because the consumer is ignorant to how things really work. Mm -hmm. On your end, if doctors were actually educating people and they were able to use layman terms that resonate with the general populace and give examples of, taking your dog to the vet and spending $5,000 to have their stomach pumped because they just ate your brand new Atlanta Braves baseball hat. Um, Poor Braves. Maybe that has happened. Maybe that has not happened um, to me or someone I know. Um, or your other analogy was, oh, your transmission just went out in your car and you're going to drop five grand to have the transmission fixed and you don't bat an eye, but I'm going to bat an eye when you're going to tell me that you can properly heal me but I have to spend $5,000. And now my first question is, well, does insurance cover it? Maybe it's because I've already spent $10,000 on my insurance premiums this year that I want to get something for it. But it is a mindset change. And it, it and where we mean, I'm a consumer, mm -hmm. are only going to listen if the experts, your clients, the doctors, are the ones that are helping us understand that. Right, and I think there's a certain conditioning that's happened, right? People are conditioned to think a certain way or they've been told certain things and that's what they have to go by, right? Who learns how to balance a checkbook in high school? Nobody did, right? And so now I'm dating myself here yes. checkbooks. <laughs> but, yes, But nobody, we didn't learn how to do that, right? And then as we adults, we had to figure it out. So I think a lot of people are taught stuff that doesn't benefit them, but it benefits well, other companies, other societal. Yeah, I, I just had someone um, comment on my LinkedIn feed, mm -hmm. and um, we did a, a, a post where we were talking about, you know, why do people, uh, Coleman asked me uh, uh, the question on air, uh, why do people make bad financial decisions? Or why do people overspend? And I, uh, my kind of, yeah, I'm like, well, they're ignorant and they're hopeless. Mm -hmm. And and someone, honestly, he disagreed with the hopeless part. And he appreciated the ignorant part. Um, and, and he said, I don't know if hopeless or they are 
um, given an ounce of knowledge and they run with it as if it's a pound of expertise, Oof. you know? And, and it's yeah. like, so people, we, we, and we do this all the time. We think we know, but really we don't know. It's um, totally side, sidebar. It's me having a conversation with one of my childhood best friends, fiance, who's a professional bartender. Mm. And she wanted to discuss her voting um, choices based on tax implications. Like her taxes would be higher or lower with one candidate or the other. And I looked at her and I said, you're a professional bartender who the bulk of your income you probably don't claim. And your income bracket is one that would not be impacted by either candidate. I said, so your vote for taxes? I go, are you worried about me and the taxes I pay? I said, because your, your vote doesn't make sense if you're making it on taxes. But what I found out is, you know, she, like most, we get an ounce of knowledge and we act like we have a pound of expertise. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's the reason why, you know, people who have their, their uh, company provided health insurance have this thought process. Well, I, I must have to go with whatever my insurance will cover because I'm already paying for it. Right. And you're like, yeah, maybe you're only paying for that because that's to help something catastrophic. Mm -hmm. And you should also budget for some other preventative or alternative that would require cash, no different than what you're going to do for your dog when it chews up your Atlanta Braves hat or your car when it needs a new, tr new transmission. By the way, it is prescription without diagnosis is malpractice. There you go. There and you we go. talk about that in the business world all the time where business operators want to prescribe or give a service to a client thinking it's one size fits all before they've ever diagnosed what it is that this client really needs or wants. Um, and for whatever reason, my mind went blank and I just butchered it. So it came back to me. I wanted to make sure I got it <laughs> emphatically on air that, uh, yeah, that, that's what I was alluding to. Good. I'm glad you caught that, yeah. uh, that fly that was buzzing around you there. Yes. Um, you know, it's funny that you mentioned, you know, finances and the tax thing and, and finance is one of the parts I cover in the book because I really, I mean, none of us in healthcare have gone to finance school. We don't learn how to budget. You don't learn how to do anything with your money that makes sense. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Doctors don't necessarily know a whole lot about budgeting and personal finance. Uh, a thousand percent. How many of them live in country clubs and drive big fancy cars but are working at 75 years old? Yeah. There's a lot, right? They they feel, and, and, and this is not a, a in any way like me poking at or, or yes. trying to, to, to call them out. It's just me saying that, you know, you spend 10, 15 years uh, in school beyond your high school years getting educated to offer a service to people because somewhere along the line you wanted to help somebody mm -hmm. right that's the 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 overwhelming i want to help people get better which is not really a why statement but we'll we'll leave it at that and then you get that and you find out that oh my god it's lucrative too who cares that i have two hundred fifty thousand dollars in student loans i need that 1.5 million dollar house and i need that eighty five thousand dollar car I need a wife now and I need to have three kids. I need to live at a country club. Like I don't, why do we, why do you do that? And I need to get each kid at 16, their own lease. And that lease payment is 650 bucks a month. And by the way, I'm going to cover it. Why, why do, why do people do that? And they do that endlessly because they feel like, well, I'm a doctor. I make the money and there's a status portion of it. Right. But how many of them tax time, look at how much money their business made and went, Oh shit. I got to pay this tax bill. And so a lot of the stuff I talk about in the financial chapter is balancing the money that comes into your practice and learning how to put aside different things. You don't need that brand new fancy C arm. You don't need to buy the latest and greatest piece of equipment to feel relevant as a physician in your field or any healthcare provider in your field. If cash is high, buy the shit you want. If cash is low, rent something else, lease it, do do something different than putting yourself into a hole to which now you've got, oh, I got three kids. I think they need to go to college. How am I going to pay for that? I got a, a house and a car, and now I have to see more and more patients to create more and more money to dig myself out of a hole that I'm never going to dig myself out of. And so talking about finances is how do you balance your personal finances so that your money works for you. And then how do you use your business and the money it makes to then open more of those same practices, hire more doctors? Scaling. You're talking about scaling. Yes. My favorite word. Get yourself out of 
owning the job and be owning the business. Stop being a business operator and be a business owner. That's the key. Now, in the beginning, you can't do that. You are everything to that business. But as you grow and as you learn how to balance your finances the right way, you can put people into place to where you don't have to treat 75 million people a week. You don't have to do that. You hire people to do that for you, and then you go on and open the next practice, and you rinse and repeat, and then you open the next location, rinse and repeat. This is normal business operation stuff that most healthcare providers don't get in their education. Yeah, think about it. car dealers. Like here, here in Orlando, Florida, um, David Moss. David Moss learned how to do that. Now, David Moss ended up selling his dealerships to um, a little company called Berkshire Hathaway. Familiar. Yeah. Um, but uh, Warren Buffett, by the way, uh, if you don't know Berkshire Hathaway, hopefully you know the name Warren Buffett. $60 but, uh, but, they just bought in gold. But uh, David Moss, at 18 years old, started working on a car lot. Mm-hmm. By 21, he was the number one sales guy, right? I'm sure by his late 20s or early 30s, he owned his first dealership. He parlayed that dealership into five dealerships. He took those five dealerships and he sold them. Um, he doesn't have the pedigree that a medical doctor does, but he had the entrepreneurial spirit Mm -hmm. and he learned and probably studied through consulting companies like yours or coaches like you, how to scale businesses, how to run businesses, how to operate businesses. And it's so cool to hear you talk, Dan, because doctors to me, I put up on a pedestal, like doctors and people who know Excel really well. Those are two people that I throw up on a pedestal. Um, the Excel thing is kind of a joke, but it's kind of not. Um, I totally get it. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but I'm listening to you. And I'm like, even doctors need business coaches. So think about this. If you're not a medical doctor, you definitely need a, med- uh, a business coach if you're running some form of a business. And if you are a medical doctor, you still need a business coach. If, if you want to elevate beyond mediocrity or above being just good. Yeah, and there's something, this is a thousand percent true what you just said. And I wrote, was writing something the other day and I was taking some notes and building out because I want to do some, some online platforms in the future so I can service as many people at one time rather than just the one-on-one thing. So I'm writing down, I'm like, okay, well, what is the biggest goal that these, that these healthcare providers would have? One, to create greater wealth for themselves and two, greater health for their patients. And that's really what it's about. And how do you maximize your ability to do both of those things, right? Everybody needs to be coached. I mean, even myself, like I have coaches, people that I rely on a call. I talk to the people's content that I consume and I go, oh man, this is really good. I need to be able to use this and transform it. And that's the only way you get better. You don't get better by doing the same shit you've always done. You You get better by making changes, by talking to people. They don't have to be experts. They just have to have done it and they just have to know a little bit more than you. Yeah, I mean, there there's a, a common theme that we talk about in uh, in our mortgage business, and mm-hmm. it's nothing changes if nothing changes. Exactly. Right? Einstein talks about the definition of, in, of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, right? Yeah, you have to make changes. And you and I follow this, this philosophy, and we live it ourselves. We are avid readers. We tend to read nonfiction books that tend to educate us, hopefully educate and entertain. I have a hard time reading a a technical manual because I'm not a good reader. But if I can get through 10 pages a day while I have my cup and a half of coffee, then yeah, I feel like each day I'm working on getting 1% better. Exactly. And this is what your your clients, your patients, your patients are the doctors. Right. The doctors have patients, <laughs> but 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 Daniel's patients happen to be the doctors. Mm-hmm. Um, and and those are things that you're trying to get them to subscribe to and to buy into. Right. And how do you eat an elephant? A one bite at a time. That's it. And it's not nobody's perfect. I heard By the right. way, start with the trunk. Because it's way tastier. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I heard Tony Robbins say this uh, a couple of weeks ago. He was like, perfection is the lowest standard you could ever have for yourself. So don't ever try to go perfect because nobody can be perfect. Just try to be better today than you were yesterday. Oh, I love try that. to learn something new today and you have to feed your mind and you got to feed your body, right? Those are two things that you need to do every single day. I just, you're talking about listening to books and being an avid reader on the way here. I just finished scrum by Jeff Sutherland. If you've never read that, it's, it's a brilliant way of organizing your work and actually getting shit done. Okay. Right. It's, it's, it was, it was brilliant. I, it was maybe a six hour audio book. It was so good. Is um, that, is that long six hours? Cause I've never done audio books. I've only read, um, 
And then I always try to buy hard copies because I like the trophy, you know? Right, right. <laughs> so so, so I mean, a hard copy, a hard cover. I like the hard cover. Right. So right. I have a trophy that says, look, I actually read a book. Right. Because for one and I didn't read it, but at least well, I have it. Well, <laughs> for decades, I was that guy. I would right. buy books and never read them. Mm -hmm. I started reading books about a year, year and a half ago. And now it's like, okay, well, I need to have a trophy for every book that I read. It's such a great accomplishment. But, uh, but no, six hours, is that a... Like, what is that, like a 200-page 200, 200 book? I have no idea. Okay. Because I honestly, for me, I can just pop the buds in, and mm -hmm. I can go exercise, or I can throw it in the car like, on the way up here. It's, what, a 30-minute ride for me up here, so it listen to 30 minutes worth of knowledge. You yeah, know? that's probably 30 pages worth. Right, yeah. and so in that easy, I think I can punish off an audiobook in about 10 days. Okay. So, which keeps me real, I think I've close to 30 books that I've done this year. So wow. some have been hard books, some have been audio books, but traveling and being in the car a lot, you, you want to consume material that helps you change the way you think, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, I th and I think a lot of, of people just get stuck in the, this is how I've always done it, which is where innovation goes to die, right? And so as a medical professional owning a medical practice, I don't want to be like everybody else. I don't want to work until I'm 95 years old. Right? I want to have a successful business that treats people the way they want to be treated and that provides wealth for me. Right, Wealth for me, health for them. Yeah. That's the goal. And as a healthcare provider, if you own a business, I would assume that you probably have the same goals. You wanted to go in business for yourself because you didn't want to play by somebody else's rules. But the problem is you haven't established your own rules for your own business. And until you do that, you're going to work endlessly and tirelessly and never feel like you accomplished anything. That's powerful. So you're talking about rules. Can you repeat that? Yeah, I said if you you wanted to go into business for yourself to create, you don't want to live by anybody else's rules. Yeah. So you went into business, but you didn't create your own rules within your own business, and so now because you still need rules, right? And then they're just with. your rules, right? Yeah, right. So what do you what are you living by? What are you what are you owning every day? What's what is for you and your business? And are you doing the things that are going to make it get to the next level? Do you even know what the next level is? And this is the, the first step I always take with everybody is like, okay, we'll have an honest look at where are you now as a business? Where are you now? 12 months from now, if it's the greatest year of your business life, what does that look like? Okay, well, why does it look like that? Why do you want to do that? And I, and I love when people are like, oh, I want to be able to give back to my community. Horse shit. If you didn't give $10 out of the 100, you're not giving 10,000 10, out of the million. Don't, yeah. don't give me the bullshit. <laughs> like really, why do you want that stuff? And then what are the steps you need to take to get there? And who do you need to talk to that's going to help you get there, right? I think one of the jaded issues that we have in healthcare is that a lot of people have taken advantage of us and us not knowing the marketing world or the sales world. And so we take somebody else's word for it and we spend money and it doesn't work. I've done it. I've spent yeah. $50,000 on marketing to have it not do shit for me, which is the reason why I'm sitting here talking to you about marketing because I was like, this is stupid. I'm going to go learn it myself. And the more I learn, the more I, the more I flip the switch on, on how I do things at the practice, test what works and what doesn't, share it with other people, and now you're creating impact not just for the people that see me in my practice, but for the people that want to have a practice that runs and does the same things that mine do. I think that's something that, that sets you apart from anyone else that's doing, that's doing consulting and business coaching is the fact that you actually practice what you preach, right? Like we, we call ourselves in our space, the mortgage space, field generals. Mm -hmm. Right. We're, so many times the, 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 the coaches or the consultants are sitting up on top of their horse that's on top of the hill watching the battle from afar. And because of their pedigree, they've never actually been down in the trenches. Whereas someone like yourself, even someone like, like, like us, no, like we're, we're battle tested. We, you have the scars to prove it. Mm -hmm. You can talk about all the times that you fell down, you bumped your nose, you skinned your knee, um, and... When you coach someone, you're coaching them saying, look, I was there. I know what it's like. Here's where I am today, and here's what I did to get there. Mm -hmm. I think that's phenomenal. I mean, I think anyone who's seeking professional expertise should look at that. Like, they, they should look at that in the person they're hiring to coach them and say, I like what you're saying, but have you practiced what you preach? Right. And the kids these days call that clout. <laughs> clout. Yes. Yeah. Yes. My, uh, we were talking about kids earlier. Yeah. My, my 15 year old um, is so, I asked him a year ago, I'm like, hey, if you could make this sports team, but you had a minimal role, but it was the, the better team to be on, mm -hmm. right? Or you could make this team and play more, which would you choose? Snap called me. He goes, the higher team, the, 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 the better team with a, 
with a more specialized role. Less playing time, but specialized role. I said, why? He goes, it's all about the clout, baby. All about the clout. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I think there's a certain amount, though. Like, I, I, I think that I would take the, the better team where I played less because the better – the better team is going to make me a better player mm -hmm. versus me being the star on the not so great team, having more play time. I don't learn anything from that. Correct. Well, and, and that, that was the big debate actually for him. Right. Um, and, and, and he made the decision, actually the decision he made it, it, it worked out great for him, mm -hmm. but that's because he had to sit down and we actually did this. We did a needs analysis, right? right? We looked at, well, what are your goals? If, if your goals are in three years to be on this particular stage, then what's going to get you there? What type of experiences do you need to go through sooner than later? Mm -hmm. And uh, he made the decision based on that. Right. Uh, and it's the same thing. You see the same thing in these doctor's offices or healthcare offices. The, everybody wants to drive the Lamborghini at 200 miles an hour and with no GPS and no <laughs> clue where they're going. They're just driving fast. I don't know. I'm going to get there, but I don't have a map. Right. And it's, it's, it, it drives me crazy because you have your hands in everything and you're going everywhere, but you have no plan. You're just doing you're just hoping to manifest something great, but you have no direction. I wonder how much of that is, is like a lot of us, especially those, those of us that are in some type of service industry or sales industry, mm -hmm. we don't have necessarily the um, foundation of job security that someone in the medical profession has. Like, look, mm -hmm. I am an MD or I'm a DO and, and unless I really screw up with some kind of medical malpractice, like. I'm going to get to do this for the rest of my life. And I'm pretty sure my income is always going to be at a certain level. And I'm curious if maybe sometimes the mindset is, you know, you and I coming from a sales and marketing background, we're always fearful that this is our best year and it's going to be worse after this. Mm -hmm. We're always fearful that in three years, based on economic conditions, what we do to provide for our family isn't going to be even in, in existence. Right. So maybe we're forced to have thought processes that, that manifest savings and budgeting and maybe the, 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 the DOs and the MDs, they're just like, yeah, well, now that I have this, look, I'm going to be an OBGYN. I'm going to make 300 to 600 grand a year for the rest of my life. It allows them to go 200 miles an hour in their Lamborghini with no GPS. But then they wind up at 75 years old still needing to work mm -hmm. when you and I, maybe by 55, we're like, eh, we work because it's fun, um, but we don't need to. Yeah. I think uh, I was watching something the other day. Um, I forget the guy that put that put it out there, um, but he was saying, "You know what the most expensive place on the planet is?" He said, "It's the graveyard because there's so many ideas and shoulda, coulda, wouldas that died." Oh wow! And left, and I was like, "Well, that's pretty brilliant." Yeah. You know, and so I think to myself, you know, how many people as healthcare providers are doing exactly what you just said? I get to seventy-five, and I'm still going, uh, did I accomplish the things that I wanted to accomplish? Or did I just think to myself, I want to be a doctor and, and own a business. And that was all I wanted to accomplish. If that's it, and that's where you are, and you're fine with working 80 hours a week, then go be that. But if there's still stuff out there that you want to accomplish, that you want to do, ways you want to give back, more time you want with your family away from treating patients 24-7, there are ways to do it. But you have to seek that education to get there so that when you do you know, slide in in those last moments, if you've been driving 200 miles an hour, you can go, man, that was a hell of a ride. I'm glad I did what I did. Yeah. Well, I would think as a doctor, um, like if, if I were one, which I would never be one because I can't work on anything that's living. Uh, dead people, I'm cool with. Dead animals, I'm cool with. Anything that's alive, don't ask me to cut into it. Don't ask me to like <laughs> poke it, prod it. Um, but no, I would think that I would love to do research. Research would be exciting, but research doesn't necessarily pay the way that actually practicing medicine pays. Right. But if I went in with you as my coach and you as my consultant helping me run a proper business, I could say, you know what, for the next 20 years, I'm going to run this practice. I'm going to scale it, maybe open up two additional offices mm -hmm. and then either sell it or have it running so smoothly that I remove myself as being the day-to-day -day practitioner because I want to be able to do research and I want my research to be my legacy, but I also have a certain lifestyle that I'm trying to afford and right. trying to live and research doesn't allow me to do that. Right. And that's brilliant. And I, I would applaud you if that was the choice that you made because you're not just living to be a doctor. You're living to give of yourself and to the next generation of people to come behind you by doing that research. And if that's what sparks drive and really gives you that self-satisfaction, then do that. 
and that is the definition of a business owner, right? Removing myself and have the business run just as well, if not better, mm-hmm. without me having my hands in it, right? Because you hire people to do things that you otherwise would need to figure out on your own, or they don't fit your personality, or you're forcing yourself to do them. Look, I might be really, really good at building a website, but it might take me six months to do it. But I enjoy it. But is it worth that? No. Go pay the guy who can do it in six days and be done with it. Dennis Miller. He was just on the show a week ago. Right. Yeah, Dennis Miller can build you a website. Right. Um, yeah, no. And websites, according to Dennis, are like three to five grand unless they're like super elaborate. Mm-hmm. And then they're like 20 grand. But most general websites are three to five. And yeah, why would you want to sit there and do it yourself? Right. Um, I, I mean, that's a whole nother show. I, I approach that with mowing my own lawn. I approach that with uh, hanging ceiling fans and getting uh, the the oil changed in my car. Right. It, it, what's my ROI? What's my time? Is this better off someone else doing? Right. Who does it better than me? Enjoys doing it, or is it something that I do because maybe I do enjoy doing it, or I do it better? But yeah, and I, I was speaking to a, a podiatrist just last week about opportunity cost. You know, um, this particular podiatrist was taking on stuff from real estate to uh, opening a second um, location for her business and all this stuff. And I'm working till 10 at night. I'm working till 8.30 tonight. And, and I said, well, what's the opportunity cost of all that? She said, what do you mean? I said, well, what's the opportunity cost? Because for everything that you take on, there's a cost to the other things. Yeah. And her response was, well, I don't accept that for myself. I, I accept that I'm going to do this and do this because I have a plan. I want to be here. I want to do that. And I want to do this and accomplish that. And I'm going to be a billionaire. And I'm like, those are all great things. But they're, the most important thing that you can do as a business owner and an entrepreneur is learn how to say no. Take on the stuff that affords you the opportunity to move your needle in the direction you want to go. Because every opportunity that you take on there's a cost to a different opportunity and you have to weigh those out. If I said yes to doing this podcast with you today and it took away an hour of something else I could have been doing for somebody else, is that opportunity cost worth it? Well, I guess we'll see. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. So um, uh, Coleman and I, JC and I did our did a show um, and we ended up calling it potpourri. It, it was a mix match of all a bunch of ideas that we thought would be good shows, but maybe they couldn't carry their own weight. And one of the topics on the potpourri episode was just because you can doesn't mean you should. Right. You know, yeah. I mean, there because you are correct. There is an opportunity cost mm-hmm. to anything that we do, whether that opportunity is not spending quality time with my children, with my spouse, giving myself a mental break, mm-hmm. or from a business standpoint, there's only eight to 12 hours a day that I can dedicate to my business. So the hour that, that you and I spend today doing this episode that is an hour that I'm not recruiting a branch in Jacksonville. That's an hour that you're not talking to your next potential coaching client. Right. And we, we had to weigh the pros and cons. Do we have time to do this on this day? And because you and I are both extremely organized, we planned this weeks right. ahead. We put it on our calendar and we knew it was time blocked out. Mm-hmm. Speaking of time, we're out of time. <laughs> but... I've loved this episode. Like, there's there is no reason why you and I should not try to do something like this quarterly. I would love because it because y- your expertise. I know your um, hyper focus is in with working with medical professionals. Mm-hmm. But what we find on this show and what you do for a living is what works for them probably works for all. I sure. mean, it's the same concepts. It's the same um, hurdles that you're trying to overcome. It's the same mindset that you're trying to um, deploy that you and I could sit here for two or three hours and just go back and forth with this idea and that idea. And, oh my gosh, how about this? Or this book we've read. So I would love to have you back on maybe beginning of Q1 and we can just do a a even deeper dive. Um, If someone wants to get a hold of the book, Amazon, what's the best way to find? Yeah, absolutely. So I would go on to um, www.thehealthcareplaybook.com. Okay. okay. And I mean, unfucking privatehealthcare.com wasn't highly suggested. So <laughs> I had to fight with the publisher on the title of the book as it was. So, um, but yeah, go to um, thehealthcareplaybook.com. You can sign up for the email list and I'll send you extra business tidbits on a regular basis, as well as you'll get access to the extras within the book. But it has James Clear did that with Atomic Habits, and I love it. 
Like yeah. I did that. I went onto the website. I signed mm-hmm. up. I get an email every Thursday from them. It's fantastic. Right. So, so kudos for doing that. Yeah, it, 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 I think it's something that you know, if you don't show up, people will forget you. But yeah, you can you can link to purchasing the book um, from that website, um, and it is on Amazon, both Kindle version and and uh, paperback. So I am not a uh, healthcare provider. Would I benefit from reading your book? You know, I've had um, sales reps, like medical sales reps, purchase my book, read it, and, and send me messages and say, dude, this was great. I know it wasn't directly towards me, but it's really helped me hone in on sales and marketing and how to speak to physicians better, how to get past the gatekeeper, how to provide a service. So um, I've got some other friends that I've helped out, a barber that, okay. that's read it, and it's, it's given him a little bit of different insight on how to do his business. Um, and then another friend of mine who actually I'm on a mastermind call with, um, she wants to set up a one-on-one with me and she's gotten into selling her own herbal supplements for dietary like cleansing and she was like how do i do this and i'm like well, give me a call let's talk about it so it it yes is it directed towards the healthcare professional sure because if you're for everyone you're for no one yeah right? so but there are other people out there within business that it obviously will benefit because it just teaches you the thirty thousand square foot uh, three square foot thirty thousand yeah. foot view of owning a business yeah no i i would um my assumption was going to be yes like my, and especially, I love what you said about if you are a vendor to medical professionals, mm-hmm. you should read this. And, and here's why. Because you now can bring value to your client by having conversations with them about topics that they're not experts on, which is how to sell and market within their practice. Yes. Um, it is, I, I would say, paramount. Mm-hmm. If you are, and I say vendor because if you're some kind of a medical sales rep, Right, whether you're a drug company, whether you're equipment, PPE, right. IT, if you service medical professionals, you should you should read this book. Yeah, I, I would say that one of, one of the biggest follies that I find, and I'm going to try not to rabbit hole you as we're at the yeah. end of our time here, but doctor's offices are the only places you're going to go where you're going to find marketing for shit that doesn't exist there. Like, why are there home and garden magazines inside of doctor's offices? <laughs> and why, is the, why is HGTV on the TV? Like, why is that? Right. So if you're a sales rep trying to help get your product into any healthcare office, talk about ways you can help them sell it. Is it just going to be a product that you carry here that lives on a shelf and gets covered up by CNN and Home and Garden magazine? Or is it going to be something that you actually are educating people that are going to use it on how to sell it? God, that is so basic. (laughs) Yet, yet so true. Basic but true. How about this? If they want to get a hold of you because um, they're interested in coaching or having you consult with them, what's the best way to reach? Yeah, you can you can still find me through the same website. So okay, I, I, that's I wanna, everything. Yep, I, it'll it'll direct you to find me in every which way, including the book, and it's one stop shop for people to get a hold of me. So yeah, www.thehealthcareplaybook.com. In my my bad hip, my bad knee, my bad neck, my neck, my back, my neck, and my back. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't lead to my practice here. Okay. Right? Yeah, my practice here is is uh, Regen S three dot com. So Why S three? Because it's regenerative sports spine spa. Oh, right? spa like yeah. facials and yeah, manicures. We do, yeah, we do some of the vampire facials. We do hair loss, which. Uh... Yeah, I think I'm <laughs> I'm like beyond help though at this point. Like I'm like, hey, that shit's like way gone. Right. Um, you should have called me when I was like 19. Uh, the problem at 19, I didn't have a pot to piss in, so I couldn't I have, 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 have afforded. None of us did. Two hundred dollars, let alone two or three grand or twenty grand to get my 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 hair follicles reimplanted. But yeah. no, so that that website again is Regen 3s. Yeah, no, Regen S. The Regens R E G E N. Okay. Yes, the number three dot com. Okay, regens yep. three dot, dot com. com. And that is the number three, yes. not T H R E E dot it. com. Yeah. Awesome. Daniel Tribby, thank you so much for taking a valuable hour out of your day to stop on by, be a guest on the Loan Officer Podcast. Guys, he's Daniel. I'm Dustin. This is all the time we have for you today. Thank you for tuning in. Check us out on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. We are the Loan Officer Podcast. Deuces.